I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Cambridge from LVR, who's going to talk about um, VR film production using things like Oculus Rift. Very cool. Cheers, Richard. Hi, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm here through Andy, who's twisted my arm. <laughs> uh, so um, hopefully uh, this will be interesting. I'm going to try and keep it as quick as I can and go through, because there's so much to talk about. It's such an exciting, new, evolving uh, technology and space with the virtual reality. So I'm going to try and narrow it down to film production in VR, as opposed to the, all the other types. So I'll kind of go through the different types, first of all. Um, I want to start off really quickly as why I got interested in this. When I was at school, I was kind of doing physics and maths and, and also did theatre studies. And they always said, what are you going to do? And I never really knew. In the last few years, I've said, oh, actually, all my drama stuff and the theatre stuff that I've been doing has really come together with my love of technology and tech. And that's really VR in the, the video space. And it's a really exciting time for me. So hopefully I can share some of my enthusiasm and knowledge about the area and about the um, tech as it is today. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, what's the aim of virtual reality, all the different types, what's 360 video VR, which is the sort of stuff that I do. And I can explain. I've brought some examples of the, some of the um, prototypes that I made in cameras. And then the technical obstacles in making 360 video. There's lots at the moment. Uh, and then some of my solutions that um, I'll share with you and anyone who's watching the video Hopefully, if you're making videos, you can make them better uh, using some of my ideas that I've been uh, developing over the last year or so. And um, drama and storytelling, that's really, really important. So I'll talk a little bit about that quickly and then a little bit about the future because it's evolving very quickly. So first of all, what's the aim in VR? Presence is what we're looking for. We're looking for a teleportation device. Uh, Facebook's been talking about this recently, but really what we want is to feel like we're in another place. So uh, you put on the kit, you feel like you're on a beach or, or wherever. I, if you imagine your favorite film, uh, just imagine your you know, favorite film ever. It's got a real power to take you away. The story, the emotion, everything about that is really powerful. But if you could be inside the film, what filmmakers are thinking is that could be even more powerful. So everyone's thinking about how to do this uh, to the best way at the moment. Um, and the aim really is, as I said, presence. So it's, it's feeling like you're there. And that's quite difficult. You've got um, information going into your eyes, information going into your ears, sometimes external stimulus as well. But your body still knows that it's in the living room or in the bar or wherever. So we're trying to make it so realistic that it feels real. There's two kind of types of 360 VR at the moment. I've got kind of a rough example here. Um, on the left, as you look at the screen, um, this is like a gaming. You've got a 3D environment. You probably all have seen these if you've ever played with any of the sort of playback devices. They're generally um, one of the big boys. CG is uh, PlayStation VR. A lot of the games on Steam and things like that are 3D environments. And you wear something like this, which is a headset, and it's got sensors so you can move around the environment but also look around the environment. Really powerful, really immersive, because it's got that natural feeling that we've got in real life. You can move around the space. Um, with video, it's more like on the right-hand side here. It's more like a sphere of information wrapped around your head. And because you don't have that spatial tracking, um, someone at Google came up with this, which is Google Cardboard. So this is massively accessible. Um, you can buy these on eBay for about three pounds. Uh, you can make one yourself. I just made this before they were kind of selling on eBay. Uh, it's a couple of lenses that I just got off Amazon, but the, you can buy the whole thing for a few pounds. You get your mobile phone, download apps. Google has them. It can be an Android. It can be an app, and it just sits inside like this, and it gives you. When I finished, come and have a look. It's really hard to demonstrate it and say what it's like because viewing it, you completely feel like you're somewhere else. And that's just a, you know, a, a, a phone in a bit of cardboard. And then I'll also rig this up to the computer, and you can try this, which is higher resolution, quicker movement, and it really feels like you're there. So what we're looking at 360 video is um, the sphere of video around the head. So that's what I've been making, and that's what I'm kind of trying to talk about right now. There are loads of people doing things with CG, like there's a company in Soho, Random42, who does really good immersive drug 
demonstrations, and you can go around the body and look around. Really fantastic stuff. So this can be used for learning and gaming, uh, also transportation to lots of other opportunities for it. But I'm looking today at video and drama and recording a real-life event for playing back. So this is a still from something I shot a couple of weeks ago. This is uh, a drama film. This is what we make. So lots of cameras, all stitched together, make this. So sorry if you've seen one of these before, but for anyone who hasn't, this is basically what we produce. We produce an equirectangular projection. So it's basically a sphere, it's flattened out. So you can see here on the right, that would match up with what's on the left as it wraps around your head. So when you put it like that, it's quite, quite sort of simple to imagine when you look around, you're looking around the sphere. And that means we need to have a really high resolution image because what we're actually looking at is a very small part of the image as we look around. So if we're going to make these 360 degree films, it's not just as easy at the moment as just getting a camera and recording it like you can with a camcorder because there's loads of different things that are stopping us at the moment. Some of those are to do with uh, the audience, what they're doing at the moment, and, and, and the uptake of having to have the kit, and also things like people feeling sick, but also to acquire those films in the first place, to record them. Uh, it's actually quite difficult, um, mainly because you need lots of cameras and you need to stitch them all together. So I've, I've, I've roughly um, put them out there. We've got um, data issues and syncing and stitching issues, and then playback issues. I'm going to look at some of the things that I've devised now for the solutions that I've been doing for managing to get videos really high quality, really good presence that look as realistic as possible. So the biggest one really is having as few seams as possible. I brought along this just to show you, because um, I've been doing prototypes for a while, and this is something I made early on, which is lots of little action cameras. And um, this was really good. You know, it, it, lots of different directions, lots of resolution, because you know, these are little HD cameras. And this went through a number of iterations before they, this is the last one before it got dumped. But um, all the rest of them probably are in this now in various places. Um, biggest thing about this is that there's so many points of error. And as, as you know, when we're making stuff, more points of error is, is not good. So to take, that, take those error points down, I just figured, well, you make less stitches, so you need wider angle lenses. So I put wider angle lenses in those cameras, and then if you put a wider angle lens on a camera, it's not high enough resolution, so you've got to go out and spend some actual money in making the cameras and getting better cameras. And that's kind of infinite at the moment. There's some really great setups with red cameras that are hugely powerful facing in each direction. But the bigger the camera, the further away you get from the center. And what we ideally want is every camera in every direction coming from exactly the same point, which is, is not possible. So we need to figure out ways to do that. Uh, and this is another early prototype that I did. And actually, did this, this is the same principle used by some of the big players at the moment. Google Jump, I've got a camera at the moment. It's based on this same principle. But this was an early thing that I did, which was virtualizing the camera in the middle. So pairs of cameras go outwards, and they produce the same pictures as an imaginary camera in the middle. So it's kind of a math thing, really. Um, what I've been filming on at the moment is an array of cameras that are quite close together, and they give us a picture like we looked earlier. But if we've got more than one camera, we've got issues. Um, and if you ever make something with a camera that isn't a standalone device, which don't really exist yet, there's some on Kickstarter that um, have, have finished but haven't been delivered yet, we need to sync up all those cameras. So this is an example here. This is something that I use sometimes. It's not what I shot the film on, but this is an array of GoPros, and they've got individual lenses. Actually, these are, are changed lenses, so I took these apart a little bit, and. Um, change the lenses. So these have got much wider lenses, which is quite scary when you get it out of the box. And then you got to you know, invalidate the warranty the day you get it, and you're going to take it apart. And it's quite a scary day. Um, pull them all apart. I hope they'll work when you put them back together. So this gives us very, very wide angle each side, which gives us lots of overlap, which makes it much better and much more robust when we're shooting something. So much less likely to go wrong and much more realistic. So if we want to sync these up, this is what we came up with, or what I came up with. 
Um, essentially, with a film, when you want to sync up the sound and the video on a regular film, you know, on a feature film, or on, as Andy's doing now, if, if he was running separate sound, he'd use a clapperboard. So if anyone, doesn't, uh, is, if anyone doesn't know what they do, when the things come together, it makes a noise. And that means that you can take the click from the sound and you can put that together with the video. Can't do that with this, because if I put the clapperboard here, this camera can't see it. If I put it here, ah, oh, how do we do that? So um, we use a bucket, put it over the top, nice and simple, covers it up. When we pull that off, we get a, clap, we get a sync point. Really, really good. Even better, someone on the internet in America came up with this idea, we just get a flash. We put that underneath, and I don't think this is on, it's got a battery in it, but the, um, the flash gives us one frame. So even if we're running at 60 frames a second, we get one frame, and we can hear that pop on the sound if we're running sound separately. If we're quite quiet when we do it. So that gives us a sync point for sound, and it also gives us a sync point so all of these cameras run at exactly the same time, so we can stitch them together. Really, really good um, way to sync them together. Also, if you've got lots of cameras, this is only four, but if you've got 16 or when you're running something like this, 12 cameras, there's a lot of data on set. So whenever I'm doing anything, I always use um, a person there with a computer wrangling all that data, checking everything, because the problem is if you have 12 cameras and one goes wrong, which they do, if you're using GoPro cameras or Mobius cameras or some of the action cameras, they're not built for this. <laughs> they're not professional cameras for this sort of job. So when you're pushing them hard and when you've taken them apart, change bits around in them, they go wrong sometimes. So one thing goes wrong, it wrecks the whole thing, so it's a bit of a disaster. So having someone check that is really, really important. And also on set, we've got, uh, we always have things like monitoring. So this is something that we, we use here, which is just checking all the settings and everything. So you can go through um, the settings on the cameras really, really quickly, make sure they're all synced up. They need to be running the same um, white balance, all of the things on the camera that can change resolution, frame rate, those things all need to be exactly right. Otherwise, what happens is the cameras are out of sync. So when you play it back and you look around, the person feels like they're not in a real environment. They know that they're in a game, they're in a film, and then they feel sick. <laughs> and that's a massive problem at the moment with VR. People feel sick. And so things to do with man ma managing that is um, minimizing the movement. That helps really, really good. So this is why we use this, which is um, remote controlled, nice and smooth. We get a very nice, smooth journey. Um, when we're walking around as a human, we, we sort of, in our brain, smooth out our walking pattern. But when we're playing it back, if we're not moving our knees and walking at exactly the same time, you feel sick. If you look around and then you see a line, it's a bit strange. You're not sure what's going on in your body. Natural reaction, you feel sick. So this is something that people are really trying to work on at the moment. And then we've got um, some of the storytelling. And this is something that some really big players are doing at the moment. I've worked really hard on doing storytelling. So if, you, if anyone makes anything in 360 degrees, it's not um, straight ahead. You miss out on something. And I'm sure everyone's heard of, uh, you know, I've put on here, um, fear of missing out, FOMO, there is a massive problem with if you watch something and you feel like you've missed it, it's not satisfying. You know, you, you want to watch everything, you want to f see everything, but you can't physically. If you're watching straight ahead, something really important's happened behind, you're going to feel unsatisfied. So I've worked really hard on storytelling with a main bit of action happening straight ahead, and then at 120 degrees this way, and 120 degrees this way, there's supporting action, and that's worked really well because everything's going on straight ahead, and you can sort of have an eye on it here. And then if you look left and right, there's extra stuff. So if you get a chance and you want to have a look, I've got a little demo here, and I've got a little part of a film that I shot. We've got a person telling you a story, and then you've got an injection being given to you this side. It is horrendous. And then you've got a guy putting on rubber gloves on this shoulder and lubing up his hat. It's horrendous. So the idea is that you're being told an uncomfortable story. The things either side of you don't matter for the story, but they add to it. So it's part of the storytelling. And also, giving constraints to us. When we're telling a story, I'm imagining that the person watching the film is going to be sat on their sofa at home. So what we don't want is something like this, 
with all the cables and everything. We don't want someone going round and then getting tangled up and get sitting up, stand, you know, knocking over their table, knocking over their beer. Horrendous. It's going to give a bad name. So certainly to start off with, I'm looking at producing stuff that can be very accessible for an audience on their sofa. Put the headset on. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, great. That's my main focus. So that's something that's worked very well. So what the aim is really is to be more amazing than a film. What I'm trying to do is take all of the good things of films and put them into this new genre and make something that is a bit better. It has to be better, otherwise what's the point? Who will put on this rather than watch a telly? You know, we, the 3D revolution at home didn't really work out because we have to put on glasses. And that's fundamentally, people don't want to do that, do they? They don't want to have to do this extra thing. It's, it needs to be a lot better. And have a go on this in a minute. It's amazing. And these are very, very re low resolution. Next year, the new version of this is coming out. This is the market leader at the moment. This is a test version. This is um, the Oculus Rift, or it's a development kit two from Oculus. Very high resolution now, but it's not quite real enough. You can still see the pixels. The next one of that's coming out next year. I think you had a talk on that before. And then this is available now, and it can put your smartphone in. And there's new phones coming out all the time with higher and higher resolutions. And there's one from Sam Samsung coming out, which is almost certainly made for VR, which is a huge, I think, I can't remember the exact specs, but hugely high resolution screen, which when it's magnified through the glasses, it's going to give a great resolution. And it's being made for VR. So that will have um, better comfort. And you know, people have it in their pockets, so they can use it for VR. So this next year coming, is going to be a huge year, and we hope to have loads of people seeing VR. Just last thing, really, I want to talk a little about storytelling and drama. People have been making things in the theatre for ages, and you know, um, thousands of years. People have been putting on plays, and there's conventions that have been made that tell a really good story. Things like you know, choreography and timing and characters and everything. They all come in theatre, and it makes a really good story come to life. If you see good theatre, it's fantastic. In movies, they do things as well to tell a story. And they paint with light to give a sense of depth. And they use close-ups and transitions and moves of the camera. And it makes a movie really engaging. But there's a load of those things that you can't do in VR. So this is the uh, last slide, really, for uh, the, the minute. This is something that I used when planning out our short film. So we're doing a big scene. This is a big fight scene. And um, you can't do any editing. It's going to be one shot. It's going to be like a theater play. So when we watch back the scene, we're going to be in the middle of it, looking around. There can't be any editing, because if there's editing, you feel sick. <laughs> but also, you lose the sense that you're in that real environment. So imagine there was a bar fight now, and you were in the middle of it. You wouldn't expect a cut. But if stuff happened around you, and it happened to come closer when it was more important, you know, it's choreographed. You wouldn't necessarily know, because you'd be in the story. So this was a map that I used for choreographing the story. And it was really, really successful. And these are the zones that we figured out that worked really well. So the green zones are where things look really good, because they're quite close, and you can see the whole body. And the green zones are where things are wow. You know, We called them the wow zones. You can't see the text. It's a bit small. But bang on straight ahead. If we if we're imagine we're looking straight, at the, straight ahead at the, at the red circle, straight ahead is where we put our lead protagonist telling us the story, straight ahead of us in your face, and then things happening to the left and the right, right in front of us. Really engaging, and that really helps to sell the story. And also, we can use things that we use for films and theater, like I put here, physical timing, imagination, you're telling a story, having sets, having great language and character. So when I produced something, I produced it in exactly the same way I always would do uh, a TV program or a feature film or a short film. Uh, you know, there's hair and makeup, there's lights, there's costumes, there's sets, there's everything that is involved with that, which gives us a production value that makes something really engaging. So come and see me in a minute. I'll set them up, and we can have a little look. Um, and also, we're using things like pace and, and things like that and, and, and music to um, heighten the emotion from, from inside. I can't go into sound too much as well, but we're trying to play sound around as well to make things even more realistic, to get back to that presence. So it feels like you're inside the actual film. So at the moment, as I said, there's a CG environment, and then there's the 360 environment. This is the slide I showed at the beginning. If you imagine we, we're filming from there, 
well, there's no way really to move around the environment because we're just filming from there. So when we're playing it back, you'd be stood here. So if this was here, that would be the only place you could stand to watch back the talk now if that was filming. That's a kind of constraint because it doesn't feel as real because you can't look under a table. You can't walk around a door. You can't go and sit next to Tom Cruise as he's talking. You know, imagine you know, a chat show where it's been recorded and you can see the host and you can go and sit on his chair next to him or walk around and look at the guest. That's what's happening at the moment. So real life recorded, there's a company called Lytro who are looking at this new type of camera. They've announced it. I don't know whether it exists in real life. I think there's some prototypes hanging around. This is a really special type of camera that doesn't have a lenses like these cameras that we've got here. It's got sensors that just capture light. And what, they mean is, um, what that means is that they can capture a digital scene and depth. So within reason, you can walk around. So for instance, if this was recording and that was one of those cameras, it would record the whole room. So we could sit there, we could sit here, we could go up to the door within reason. And that's the future. It means that we're going to have devices that can record real life environments and play them back. And then we start to get into the realms of teleportation. And that's what Facebook's talking about. So the future of VR is amalgamation of computer graphics and film. And it's a really exciting time to be. So thanks very much. If anyone's got any questions, um, that's kind of all I've got to talk about, really. Um, I've got some demos to show you if you want. Yeah, binaural is a technique of recording sounds around in a space and then putting them down into two um, earphones. That's huge with VR because it, it feels like you're in a space and you've got 3D sound, but you've only got headphones. So inherently with a device like this, you've got headphones. It's a singular experience. You're not in a room which can be surround sound. You've got headphones on. So binaural is mixing those sounds down into the headphones. And it's an old technique, really, binaural. People used to record with a head-shaped thing and rubber ears with cam uh, um, microphones going out either side. And there's lots of experiments. When we shot the film, we, we recorded lots of sounds from all different directions. Everyone had um, little mics on them hidden. We had lots of mics around the set. We, we took an ambience of the room, and we've mixed that down into a binaural feed, which then spins around. So if you look over here, we can play it back. And that's part of the experience. So binaural has been massive, yeah, in VR. And it continues to evolve. We're doing lots of work in that. Probably as much work in that as there is in the, in the um, thing. Oh, I didn't talk about 3D as well. The cameras like this are doing a stereoscopic as well, which is not just recording a sphere, but it's a 3D sphere. So when we're looking at something close, it's, it's 3D. That helps with the immersion. In a room, like Star Trek, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, like the holodeck, that's the aim. So it, at the moment, it's a really singular experience. Um, I recently was lucky enough to try on a new HTC one of these. So it's HTC have got a, a headset very similar. It's got lots more sensors. And they're bringing something out, I think, in the next year or so domestically. And you put sensors around your room. So you put four sensors. I think the domestic one's got two sensors, which are lasers that track you in the space. So it, you are wearing a headset, and it's a very singular experience because you're looking around and you're putting data back into the system that it needs to feed to you. It's, but the resolution of that is astonishing. It is, you can't see the pixels. And that's a cartoon world, but you can walk up to something, and then one of the demos is a bow and arrow on the floor. You can walk up to it, you can walk around it, you can pick it up with a glove on. You can look at it. You can fire the bow by going like this, and then outside your room. You can see your room in like the walls, but they're see-through, they're, they're lines, and you can shoot stuff outside your room. So that's what I imagine the future's going to be, a bit more like that, augmented reality. So you've got your real room, but stuff, and, and Microsoft's doing a lot of work on that as well. So I think it's almost always, at the moment, going to be an individual experience, but then they'll be linked up so you'll be able to see people playing with you. But we need, we need to feed stuff into each eye individually. So it's to get the 3D experience. You need to have that, really, because at depth on your own wall, you wouldn't get that 3D experience because the, the distance is too far.
I hope that answers the question. I think I have read it, yeah. Um, is that an apocalyptic thing where they're in the bar? No, the Ready Player One's all about the future where everyone plays games in a fully immersive uh, 3D environment and actually they go back and play all of the, the old 2D, 3D, you know, star games and things like that um, in their 3D environment and things like that, so it, as well as sort of futuristic games. Gaming's massive. Yeah, gaming is massive in this. One of the big players is PlayStation VR, and they are huge, and they're going to be releasing all of their games in this medium. So, yeah, and I think those retro games have a, a big following, so why wouldn't you want to go back and play those? They've got a lot of nostalgia associated with them as well as really good playability. So, yeah, I can see that there's a, a reason to want to play that. I want to play Tetris with real things, and I want to do that. Yeah, that sounds great. Play Minecraft now in 3D. That's what people are going to be doing. <laughs> Whether it's useful for society, different question. <laughs> I think people will be. Yep. Yep, that's really good for um, looking around. Really good. You get a scene down the middle that's really low resolution. You get one up and one down that's not very good. It's all about what's best, really. The resolution looking through a mirror, though, isn't as good. It's all right. It's pretty good. But you're looking down and spreading that around. So uh, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Lots of people do do that. Um, I think looking out is better. Um, some of the big boys using the system like this with 16 cameras, and some people, like the jump one, is 16 GoPros. High resolution, higher than that, because and also in 3D because of the way that they're virtualizing cameras. So there's advantages of having lots of cameras, much more resolution, because you can do stereoscopic, and you can't do that with the mirrors. And you also can do the top and the bottom and a, and a better seam. And that seam is where you look. So you want that to be high res. You don't want that to be the lowest res. So that's the reason people are doing cameras. So. I don't know. I eight hours. Is someone you've done eight hours? <laughs> I don't feel sick at all doing it. Yeah, to, I don't uh, editing this. Uh, I'll I'll do hours. I doesn't I doesn't affect me at all. And I think that's because I know what I'm editing, so my brain kind of knows it's not real. So I don't feel sick at all. But some people, even for a demo, have felt really sick. So we were really careful when we were shooting the film not to move the camera so much. Something I did when Andy helped me out with a, a shoot, um, we carried something like this, and we walked it around the ship. So we walked it around a, a Royal Navy ship. Uh, when it was static, so it was on a tripod, and we walked away, people were fine with that. As soon as they were happy doing that, someone picked it up and walked instantly. Oh, oh, because oh, their body wasn't moving. They were used to standing still, looking around the bridge or underneath the ship. As Soon as it moved, their body wasn't moving. Straight off, straight off. So when we were shooting the 360 drama, we were keen not to move the camera, which I think in the future will be eliminated by um, people doing things in different ways and customers being used to it, v viewers being more used to it. I think resolution will help as well. When resolution is very, very good, it won't feel so bad, because at the moment, it's two telly screens right next to your head. It's, it's not great to start with. Yeah, Tony, I mean, I, when I first started with Dr. Christie came to it, um, first time I got it, felt a bit, I don't get motion sickness or sleep sickness. Um, and first hour, I felt a bit spaced out, and had to stop off two hours. Second hour, did five hours. And then after that, I could pretty much tell um, your brain sort of calculates that you're in an environment that's not real and just you used to it. Well, mine did anyway. But, uh, on, on the Xbox did. One, there's uh, <laughs> the, uh, I haven't played it. There's a game, a, the Alien game, where you can look around the ship. So you can walk around the ship with your controller, with the headset on. People play that for a long time. Um, it, people obviously acclimatise. The best one I've seen recently is on the YouTube uh, 3D channel. I made a version of Cardboard for my Nexus 7. 
Yep. Yep. So That's new. Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, uh, quickly come down to the theme film. Uh, three sixty and saying that you know the Chinese are the great example of it going mainstream. That's what's happening at the moment. Google have really embraced it and they've, you know, given the technology to all of us with a version of YouTube now. So if you, go, if you download the new YouTube app on your phone and search for 360 videos, they're instantly 360. So you can look around just with your phone without a Google viewer and you can see there's some really good examples and I'll be putting this film up as soon as we've finished it. I'll be putting that onto YouTube straight away because there's a massive amount of people that are embracing this now. And even without a viewer, you still get a really good sense of space by looking around, especially on a Nexus or on an iPad, looking around the viewer. So imagine going to a hotel that you were going to go to and you could look around your room before you got there. Okay, great, I'll book it. If you're buying a house or somewhere, going somewhere that you've never been to, that possibility then is looking through a little window into a real world. It's not a glossy video that's been produced that might be a bit fake. It's, oh, okay, yeah. And we all do it on Google Street Map but it will just be video, same thing. It's exciting times, really. It's just progression of Google Street Maps, really, but in video. Did you see the um, demo of Hot Speed, 360 movie thing, which was about a year ago? That was fantastic. You're at a, I think one of the scenes you were at a wedding. You're standing there when, you, when it kicks off. Yeah. And, and what people are coming up to you talking, and it's really surreal. They're like talking to your face. And then suddenly, the next thing you're in, you're in middle of Africa with buffalo running around. Yeah. Weddings is something that people have been talking about at the moment. I've done a demo of a christening. I just put that up in the party, and everyone's like this. You play it back, and it's like you're stood there in the party. And I can imagine for a wedding or something like that, when the people are doing speeches and they're all, you know, in the most expensive day, of, I mean, the best day of their life, <laughs> they can play that back. Like, it's a massive, massive market for that. And, and this technology, when it becomes one unit, I can see people buying them like camcorders. At the moment, that's not possible for all the reasons that I said. But when this becomes one download with one card or wi fi onto your computer, it'll be huge. So at the precipice now, something pretty cool with 360 video, I think. This question was the software that's required to do it. The software that you desire, is it easy to be able to film it originally, very expensive, and then what's the software support for actually viewing it back afterwards? So you've got options on YouTube, but it's as if I'm trying to watch back with things like VLC, if you have to pause it, or... So not VLC at the moment, the biggest, there's lots of players that play it back, so once you've got that projection that I showed you uh, at the beginning, the, this is what you make, and then to play that back, you need a player. Um, there's loads of free ones. Uh, lots of people have made them. Um, uh, there's um, Live View Rift is a really big one. There's things like Whirly Gig that people are using, which lets you put files in and then pre-configure them for sending out to everyone. So lots of people use those for like creating apps and creating things. And there's um, Oculus Player. There's lots of different players made by different people. To create them, um, there's two big players at the moment. There's um, a program called, um, by a company called Color, who I think has been bought by GoPro, I think. Um, and there's also Video Stitch, which is the one I use, which is, they're both French companies actually, doing the stitching. So we take lots of cameras, stitch them all together. And Video Stitch and the Color program both use a program called PT GUI to do the calibration. Um, they do some automatic stuff, but it's not very good. So workflow wise, Video stitch, I'd recommend. You need a CUDA video card, so you need a really high-end video card. Um, sort of four gigabytes or higher, I'd say, was sensible. But it's, it's, it's relatively accessible. Um, and there's um, presumably in the future GoPro going to be bringing something out, but that's speculation on my part, really. And I'd expect, I'd expect that to be free, but that's speculation. So it's, it's not difficult to do. And there's demos of all of those that you can use at low resolution uh, for free. And to do something for a Google Cardboard, you can use it on the free versions. So you can do that yourself now. It's pretty easy. Take you a couple of days, and you can do something easy. All right. Thanks very much. I hope I didn't go on too long. Um, thanks very much for having me here. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.